Hi, good afternoon and good morning to some. I'm Vivian from Singapore Water Association. Thank you for attending today's Water Resource Recovery Dialogue between Denmark and Singapore on key innovations and opportunities ahead in the water sector, jointly organized with the Danish Water Export Association and supported by the Denmark embassies. Ministry of Environment of Denmark, PUB Singapore's National Water Agency, and several of our Danish partnering organizations. Before we proceed, I'd like to touch on some housekeeping rules and disclaimer clauses. To ensure better connectivity, please mute your microphone and turn off the camera. You may communicate with us after the event. Please share your questions in the Q&A icon, which is right bottom, where we'll try to provide answers where possible in each segment. Do identify yourself so we can respond to any unanswered questions. We'll be recording this session and reserve the rights to the video. Please complete a one minute poll survey at the end of the session where we'll forward the recording instruction, download the instruction of the recording and presentation that to the respondents. All information shared is for general information only and does not contain or convey any legal advice or admit assistance. Information shared today is true and accurate as of publication date. The organizers and speakers reserve all rights in the provided materials. Without further ado, may we have Mr. Mark Perry, Senior Commercial Advisor, Danish Embassy Singapore, for the speaker's introduction. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Vivian. So, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, welcome to this uh, water resource recovery dialogue between uh, Denmark and Singapore. And thank you very much to Singapore Water Association for, for hosting the event, uh, PUB as well, and the large group of, of Danish partners we have on board. Uh, I won't mention everyone because it would simply take, take too much. We have pretty much everyone from the Danish water space here today. So the event today aims to uh, create awareness around Singapore International Water Week but also to create uh, interest for kickstarting innovation and co-creation within the water resource recovery space. Uh, we have a very busy schedule ahead of us. So without further ado, I would like to pass the word to Ambassador Sandra Jensen Landy from the Royal Danish Embassy for her opening remarks. Ambassador, please. Your mute button, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon and good morning, everyone, ladies, gentlemen, distinguished panelists. Welcome to this discussion. Uh, I'm happy to bid you all uh, welcome. I know that um, webinars no longer have this uh, sex appeal as they had uh, around a year ago, but I think uh, today our webinar shows exactly why this virtual format is here to stay. Um, we gather yep. a group of, of experts yep, uh, from around. Sorry. Oh, okay, we gather a, a group of experts from around the world uh, who will talk about a topic that they all uh, care and know a lot about. We build uh, bridges between Singapore and Denmark. We extend our collaboration even in a time where we cannot meet. And we build up to an even larger uh, event. As, as Mark just mentioned, um, this is a building block towards uh, the Singapore Water Week, uh, where we on 25th June will have the green talks between our two countries with the participation of our ministers for environment and sustainability. Uh, that again, I think will build up to an even larger and hopefully physical event in, in 2022. So in other words, uh, this format allows us to keep on uh, advancing our collaboration, keep on learning from each other, keep on moving ahead, even in a time where we cannot meet. And that's exactly what we want to do. Keep advancing. We are two uh, pretty advanced countries when it comes to, to uh, water technologies and resource recovery, but we can still do more. We can learn from each other and we can remain in the lead uh, globally. So today, uh, the aim of the session is to, is to exactly share uh, our best practices, our cutting edge technology, and, and learn from each other. How far have we come? Where are we heading? And we already have a framework for collaboration in place. Uh, last year, just before uh, COVID hit, our ministers agreed on a memorandum of understanding that sets out uh, a very clear uh, work program 
and a framework for collaboration. So there should be no doubt that there's simply support from both sides from the highest level to advance this uh, collaboration. Uh, that goes for, for, uh, for uh, uh, partnerships between companies, public private partnerships with strong corporate partners uh, in the driving seat. In you know, whichever way we can collaborate, there's support for it and we have a framework in place. Exchange of information, study visits when we one day can do it, promotion of ties between our government bodies, public-private partnerships and pi pilot uh, projects, um, cross-participation uh, in, in flagship events like we just talked about with the Water Week coming up, joint research, publications, all of that is in this MOU that sets a beautiful framework for our collaboration. So if today you, you walk away from this webinar with some ideas for how to advance our collaboration, maybe it's a small pilot, maybe it's some research, maybe it's an idea you picked up on, please do not hesitate to reach out, at least from the embassy side, we're very happy to help you move uh, forward in the collaboration. This is what we are here for. Denmark has set some ambitious climate goals, as I'm sure many of you are aware. We have even recently added a milestone that, that means that by 2025, we have committed us to a 50 to 54% reduction. We're still aiming for 70% in 2030 and to be climate neutral in 2050. We just still don't know how to get there. We need partnerships. Uh, we need to, to, uh, to work together on this sustainability journey. But there should be no doubt that uh, the journey has to, to start now or continue now. So, uh, so if there today we will sow some seeds of collaboration that can get us to the right destination, then that's what we that's what we're here for. That's what we hope for. So I hope you will um, you will do your your bit to to make sure we have uh, flourishing partnerships. And and again, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out if we can be of any help to advance that from our side. I wish you all a fruitful discussion today and. Uh, Looking forward to learning from where you all are with your with the latest innovations in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, for those words. Um, I would also like to encourage everyone to post their questions uh, in the Q and A box, and we'll um, we'll raise them at the, at the right time during this event. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Pang Chi Meng, Chief Engineering and Technology Officer from PUB. Dr. Pang Chi Meng, please. Hello, can everyone hear me? All right, uh, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Ambassador, for the kind introduction of uh, the state of warm relations between our, our two nations. Um, so, this today, uh, I'm first going to thank uh, the Danish Export Association as well as the Singapore Water Association for inviting me to give what is essentially a water perspective to uh, resource recovery. So uh, we over at QB here, we are the National Water Agency. So um, the, the things that I'll share today uh, are coming from um, the perspective of water. And um, hopefully these are some of the things that we are working together with the other agencies in Singapore to form part of a bigger plan to tackle the issue of environmental sustainability in Singapore. So, yeah. To start off, right, um, perhaps uh, I would like to maybe give a brief introduction of Singapore to some of our Danish uh, friends who may not be very familiar with us. Um, so Singapore lies in the heart of Southeast Asia. We are a small country with about 720 square kilometers. Uh, and but we have a big population of 5.7 million people. Uh, although we have a lot of rain that falls onto our ground, um, we uh, are unable to store most of the rain that falls onto our, our ground because of the limited space that we have. And this forms really the basis of our uh, challenge. So we, we, we have a natural disadvantage in land. We have a uh, we are water stressed, uh, but at the same time, we are facing an increasing water demand. Uh, we have no natural resources and, and we have quite a lot of people to, to, to serve. And at the same time, there is an aging population with rising expectations. 
Um, so uh, with this backdrop, uh, I would like to introduce some of the agencies that are involved in uh, the, the drive for environmental sustainability in Singapore. So these efforts are largely coordinated out of the Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment. And uh, below it, there are three uh, agencies uh, that support different aspects of uh, the environment. The first, of course, is the National Environment Agency. So they are in charge of uh, clean land, clean air, as well as public health. Uh, on the other spectrum is the uh, Singapore Food Agency that really talks about uh, securing the supply of safe food for Singapore. Um, for uh, PUV itself, we are Singapore's National Water Agency, and obviously our mandate is to pr pr produce uh, clean water to the population. And to give a better sense of what uh, we, we are in charge of, um, Singapore, uh, PUV actually operates the entire uh, water loop. So for the moment, um, the rain falls onto the ground. We are in charge of stormwater management and we channel them into our 17 surface water reservoirs. Uh, the water is then treated by us to be sent to 1.5 million customers. And subsequently, we will collect all these uh, used water and treat them in our water reclamation plants. Uh, we produce a hybrid uh, recycled water called new water. And this uh, new water is being subsequently sent back to, the, to, to, to either the, the industry or a small portion is back, sent back to our reservoirs uh, to mix with uh, the rainwater. Um, back in the early 2000s, we also started uh, seawater desalination. So essentially, uh, we operate uh, the entire water system as a loop. So in a sense, uh, you can say that PUV has been practicing circularity for water since the early 2000s when we started reclaiming uh, a new water, as well as consolidating the functions of drainage and sewage into one agency. Uh. Um, so in a sense, in the push, so, so we, are, we actually do all these things because we are pursuing water sustainability. But uh, in a knowing manner, we are also the, one of the early, early practitioners for circular economy. So having set up the water loop right as a basis for our water sustainability, there are still remain challenges. Uh, one of the key challenges is, uh, is of course, uh, rising um, water demand. So from now to the year 2060, we project that our water demand will more than double. Um, and if we were to use existing technologies to um, meet this increasing demand, it will mean we are projecting that we need three times more energy than we need today, as well as we produce about two times more sludge. Now. So all these uh, three actually issues are non-trivial for, for, for resource-constrained um, countries such as Singapore. So then, uh, this leads us to think of different ways of trying to address uh, these few challenges. And we go back again to the uh, concept of circularity that has so far proven important in our pursuit of sustainability. So we see three uh, elements in this particular uh, nexus. Uh, the first one is, of course, water, where we, where we treat every drop as precious. Uh, second is on energy, and we address the key issues of um, efficiency, generation, and substitution. And lastly, of course, is waste, and this is where we, will, we hope to treat it as a resource rather than something that we have to deal with. So to go through each of them uh, briefly, um, the, the first uh, element of water where every drop is precious, we really encapsulate this um, mantra by collect, trying to capture every single drop of rain that falls onto our ground. Um, today, we are collecting about, we have two thirds of our land area that is uh, there's water catchment, and we hope to increase more as the opportunity arises. Um, we have uh, four seawater desalination plants today. Um, these are energy intensive processes, but we continue to build uh, more desalination plants with another one coming up later part of this year. And because we spend so much effort in collecting every drop of rain that falls onto our ground, we, 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 we spend so much energy in desalinating our seawaters. We find that using the water once is very wasteful, and as a result, we have also the philosophy of trying to recycle the water endlessly in a loop. So um, this forms the basis for our plan for water sustainability. But of course, we also have to uh, tackle the demand side of the equation. And that is where we also have an ambitious uh, plan to try to um, cut our domestic water consumption to 130 liters per capita per day by 2030. This may not be very high from uh, European standards, uh, but actually it is it's something that is maybe the peculiarities of our weather that uh, we, we, we hope to achieve at uh, this level. Um, so we introduced a series of structural measures such as um, mandating that the sale of only certain water effic efficient equipment 
to be sold in Singapore to try to achieve this aim. But ultimately, we also have to rely on the cooperation of people to try to change their water using habits to be able to achieve uh, this aim. Uh, of course, the other major user for water in Singapore is uh, the, the industry. And for that, uh, we work with the uh, individual companies to, 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 to do water audits and to try to identify opportunities for uh, recycling. Uh, the next element, of course, is, is, is energy. So energy, we are trying to address the key issues of uh, efficiency, generation, and substitution. Uh, in terms of energy efficiency, we have uh, invested quite a big way in, uh, in trying to overhaul the processes that we use in our treatment plants. Uh, one major area, of course, is in the area of uh, membranes, whereby we try to do R&D with a variety of partners to produce high permeability membranes. Uh, of course, one of our key partners is, uh, is, is, is from the Danish uh, alcohol company. Um, and of course, uh, in the recent years, uh, the advance of digitalization tools have changed, have changed many industrial sectors. We over here in Singapore have also tried to um, upgrade our water management system to be more AI enabled. And this helps, helps, helps to let us uh, better manage our energy uh, intensive processes to try to find opportunities to cut energy. On the aspect of uh, generation, the major initiative here is to try to achieve energy neutrality in uh, our used water uh, treatment. Here, we try to convert um, as much of, uh, of the carbon in the water to uh, biogas as possible. And we do it through um, things, um, processes such as um, looking at uh, anaerobic digestion of our starch waste, waste as well as to try to figure out uh, better ways of improving the digestibility of the, uh, these sludges to improve uh, biogas production. Uh, lastly, uh, we are also looking at alternative energies that will help us uh, offset our energy requirements on the grid. Uh, one major initiative, of course, is the floating solar deployments that, that you can see in the picture on our surface water reservoirs. Um, we have um, a plan to progressively deploy more and more floating solar panels on our uh, reservoirs. Um, for example, by, by uh, 2021 this year, we will probably have about 70 uh, megawatts peak of floating solar deployed uh, throughout Singapore. And uh, this is sufficient power to run all our water works uh, here. Other possibilities of certain power also um, is, is, is in the area of technology such as uh, pressure retarded osmosis. In this uh, case, we are exploiting the salinity difference between uh, two waste brine streams produced from seawater desalination as well as uh, our new water production to exploit the difference such that to produce uh, energy. So this is largely an R&D project as of now, but we are proceeding well and looking into going to a pilot in one of these two, uh, in these two years. Oh, the last element of the nexus, of course, is, uh, is waste where we, whereby we treat it as a resource. And this is where uh, we see this not just as a PUB problem, but also a national one. And this stems from the fact that uh, there is only one landfill left in Singapore, and, as, and it will run out of space by year 2030 if the concept of, um, if the concept of a linear economy continues, whereby uh, waste that, uh, whereby materials that are produced are just used and, and, and sent to the landfill. Um, so really, uh, this is where um, PUB makes our contribution towards the larger national vision of a zero waste nation, whereby uh, we have set aside a concrete target of trying to reduce our waste sense to the landfill per capita by 30% by 2030. Um, in this aspect, uh, PUB also supports this uh, larger national vision. We also hope to reduce 30% of our sludge to landfill but we hope to achieve it earlier than 2030. And we, and, and we, and we hope to do this uh, by means of two approaches. One, of course, is to try to produce less sludge in our processes. And of course, the other one is to try to recover our uh, resource from sludge. So the first approach, I think I kind of some of these um, technologies earlier. They are also slightly similar to the technologies that allow us to recover uh, energy from uh, the waste. Uh, things like uh, thermal hydrolysis as well as the cold digestion of food waste are able to reduce the volume of sludge and correspondingly uh, gives us more biogas for our energy. 
Uh, we are also tying with toy development concept called the anaerobic membrane bioreactor. And this, uh, we include this, we hope to overhaul our mainstream uh, use water treatment to put them through anaerobic processes to produce biogas directly instead of relying on the conventional activated such process that generates sludge and carbon dioxide. Uh, approach two uh, is, uh, is, of course, a resource recovery from sludge. Uh, this schematic shows the various waste streams that we have in, in, in PUB um, and how they are treated at the moment. So the sludge from our uh, wastewater reclamation plants are being sent to incineration plant before they are being sent to landfill, while the sludge from waterworks are being sent to landfill straight away. There's high costs incurred in, in their disposal, and of course our target is to see whether we can transit to a more circular economy whereby we reuse some of these uh, materials to preserve the landfill as well as to generate uh, cost savings. Um, this slide represents some of the technologies that we are currently toying um, to or, or piloting to, to, to understand whether it is possible to produce valuable resources from uh, the waste. Um, technologies such as uh, pyrolysis is able to produce biochar that will eventually feed into the urban farms that uh, our Singapore Food Agency is uh, pursuing. Um, gasification turns the sludge into a uh, glass-like material that is able to fulfill a variety of uh, structural as well as non-structural construction applications. Uh, the, the photo here shows the plaza in front of a uh, particular building and it's made up of uh, and, it, and, and it's underlaid by um, the slab that is produced from insulation ash. We are also looking at some of the other technologies such as hydrothermal liquefaction to try to convert our sludge to bio crude. Or maybe even novel technologies that, that, that may be possible to convert sludge into bioplastics. Um, this has been demonstrated in many of the uh, microorganisms whereby they are able to sequester um, PHAs. And um, while this tech has been around for a long time, it is difficult to work on a, on, on a feedstock such as sludge. So um, anything in those areas, uh, we, we are keen to explore to try to convert our sludge to useful resources. And of course, um, the key question here is, is, is whether uh, we produce these products for the Singapore market or whether they are exportable. Um, this is something that I think uh, we have to um, look at international trends as well as uh, international regulations to, to, to be able to better address. I've indicated earlier that actually the efforts of UV dovetail into a bigger government plan. So um, the Singapore Green Plan is this particular uh, government initiative whereby it is a whole nation uh, movement to try to advance Singapore's uh, national agenda on sustainability development. Uh. Um, really, it is about meeting uh, Singapore's uh, commitments under the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda as well as the Paris Agreement. And we uh, hope to achieve um, those uh, objectives uh, using the five, based on the five pillars that you see here uh, in the slide, uh, city in nature, sustainable living, energy reset, green economy, as well as a resilient future. Um, lastly, I would just like to make a pitch for the Singapore International Water Week. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an event starting on the 21st of June. So we are still hoping for the 21st of June event to be a hybrid event whereby we are able to welcome some uh, visitors from overseas to uh, to attend the conference. But if you are unable to join us physically, uh, don't, don't worry. We have another 10 days of uh, virtual events from the 21st of June to 2nd of July, whereby we will have a comprehensive uh, suite of online content um, uh, covering uh, the entire urban water space. Uh. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pang Chi Meng, for that very comprehensive overview of, of activities in Singapore. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Johannes Jion Go, Special Consultant from the Ministry of Environment of Denmark. Johannes, please. Well, thank you for the word and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I presume you can see my slides. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, uh, in Denmark we are about 5.8 million people, uh, and we have uh, 30 million pigs uh, in, in in our farms in Denmark. Uh, 63% of the land is uh, aerial or land is used for agricultural purposes. It means that the biggest problem with water in Denmark is a nutrient to the water environment. Uh, in my presentation today, I will go into discharges uh, or emis emission of uh, nutrients, a look at uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gases, and then uh, resource recovery. I will look mainly on energy. Uh, in phosphorus, we have the, a target in Denmark to reuse 80% of the phosphorus in sludge. And then carbon, uh, thank you for your presentation of the possibilities in Denmark. The utilities also look up on the uh, possibilities to utilize uh, carbon better than they do today. Uh, but I think there will be some Danish utilities uh, later on who can give uh, the more technical uh, presentations on that. Uh, in Denmark, uh, on uh, we focus on nitrogen and phosphorus in uh, our discharges from uh, the wastewater company, uh, wastewater plants. Uh, as you see here, we have a, a very low discharge, uh, 4.8 milligram per liter of nitrogen and uh, 0 0.5 milligram per liter of phosphorus. Uh, the Danish uh, utilities have very low discharge uh, compared with what they are allowed to. If you look at the urban wastewater directive from EU, it says that nitrogen should be uh, 10 if you are on. Uh, uh, if your plant is bigger than 100,000 PE and 15, if it's a smaller uh, uh, one, uh, if you are leasing phosphorus to fresh water and is uh, bigger than 100,000 PE. In the Danish wastewater order, we have uh, translated that to 8 milligram for all Danish plants uh, with more than 5,000 uh, PE, I think. And in phosphorus, we have uh, translated it to one uh, for all plants, uh, for uh, one milligram per liter for phosphorus and 1.5 for uh, seawater. Uh, why do the, what are the drivers for the utilities to go so far below uh, the targets uh, in the regulation? There's the uh, uh, SDG. Key goal 63 uh, uh, regarding wastewater to half of the, the wastewater. Nearly all Danish uh, municipalities and utilities work with the uh, global goals, uh, global sustainable goals. On uh, EU level, we have uh, the water framework directive that tell us that uh, all our waters should be in good ecological and chemical uh, condition in uh, 27, uh, 27. Uh, today 98% of the Danish uh, uh, water environment is not in good uh, condition. So we have to do uh, effort there. We have the urban wastewater directive I, I showed you before where the threshold is in, the, in, in that directive. We have the wastewater order and that uh, mainly uh, in Denmark we have tax on discharges of nutrient to sea or fresh water. Uh, for every kilo of nutrient uh, of uh, nitrogen, uh, a utility uh, discharge to, to the sea, uh, to the water, they have to pay five euro. And for phosphorus, it's, it is a, it's a even higher. It's a 23 euro per kilo. So uh, the utilities in Denmark are, made, are not going or the, what you say, the thresholds, but they are more going for, for what are, what are the economical uh, optimum for them. And on the local level, I have uh, written professional pride, Danish wastewater uh, workers and Danish wastewater plants uh, do even better than they have to because they have professional pride as engineers and they want to clean the water as much as they are uh, possible. Uh, 
On national level, we have also water area plans. We tell uh, every water area in Denmark, what are you do, going to do in, the, in this area? We have to do the new plans for 20, uh, 2021 to 2027. And we are uh, doing it accordingly. Uh, and uh, there we have to see how much nutrient can uh, go to, to each uh, water area. And then we have a uh, discharge permits adapted to local conditions. So if you are discharging to a sea, you get uh, a threshold even lower uh, than the thresholds in the wastewater order. Uh, in Denmark, uh, we, look, we have worked with uh, energy neutrality for some years, the last 10 years in the water sector. Uh, the International Energy Agency have uh, made, uh, in, I think, 2016, uh, a publication where they showed the uh, water sector share of the total electricity consumption. Uh, in the world, it are around 4%. In Europe, USA, it's around 3%. Uh, and in Denmark, uh, it was in 2015, 1.6%. Uh, and we expect it to be uh, in 2040, uh, 0%, but alre al already in 2030, actually, in Denmark. Uh, we, every year, we uh, benchmark every, uh, all the wastewater utilities in Denmark on the energy use. And the next slide, you can see that uh, in totally, the wastewater plants in Denmark uh, uh, as nearly sells, uh, produce all the energy they use. Uh, they produce today 88.4% of the energy they use for the whole uh, uh, wastewater uh, circle. Also with the sewer systems, uh, they produce uh, today 70% uh, of what they use. Uh, in Denmark, as the ambassador told you, we have a goal to be to reduce the uh, carbon emissions with uh, 70 percent in uh, 2030. Uh, and for that reason, we set all the branches in Denmark together, three, uh, 13 branches together, to to come with plans for 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 this uh, this uh, for each branch. Uh, like East sector. In Denmark, uh, the water sector was a part of the waste sector. Uh, and on the water area, there was a, we have to limit the values for nitrous oxide emissions uh, uh, in wastewater. And we introduced a Paris model uh, for an energy and climate neutral water sector. What is a, par a Paris model? It is, we have asked all the water and uh, wastewater companies in Denmark, what are your goals, ambitions for energy and climate in uh, 2025, 2030, and 2035? Uh, and uh, all the companies are asked to give in the information on electricity use, heat, oil, gas, uh, district heating, uh, biogas production, uh, methane emissions from septic tank biogas production, nitrous oxide uh, emissions. Uh, today, in, in nitrous oxide uh, is uh, by far the most uh, is by far the area where the wastewater sector uh, influence or, or have the biggest emission of uh, climate gases, uh, and then uh, nitrous oxide avoidance. Our draft results, we are working on it and we expect our minister to present it in the end of this month, show that the Danish wastewater sector is going to be CO2 neutral already before 2030. Uh, and where they, do it come from? Uh, Yes, very, very much of it today, uh, very much of the emissions come from the nitro, as I said, nitro uh, oxide from processes and the wastewater plants. And we have, uh, 
we are, uh, are going to have regulation on, on this emissions. So by 2025, all uh, wastewater plants uh, with more than 30,000 PE have to halve the emission of uh, nitrogen dioxide. On the other side, uh, we have production of energy and we have an uh, uh, avoidance of nitrogen in nature because if you uh, discharge nitrogen in nature, you will produce uh, nitrogen oxide. What are the drivers for climate neutrality? It's the Paris Agreement and SDG uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, on EU level, there's a goal on 55% reduction in uh, 30, 2030. It's a greater uh, framework directive, and uh, we have to limit the nitrous discharges to have a, a less eutrophication in the Danish uh, waters. Uh, there's a sector integration strategy. On, level, on national level, is the 70% goal. Uh, and national goal on climate and neutral water sector. And in, for many utilities, it, 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 on local level, climate ambition in the utilities or in the municipalities. Uh, and I think some utilities work with it because there's a lot of talk about uh, CO2 emission pricing in Denmark. And uh, I think uh, they worked to avoid that. On the energy uh, production or efficiency, uh, we expected uh, the sector to be uh, energy neutral or energy positive uh, by 2030. Uh, our uh, draft result of the questionnaire among the utility shows uh, as, uh, as told before, much of the efficiency comes from uh, uh, come from uh, digitalization. Uh, we can see that Danish wastewater plants can reduce their energy use by 70% by implementing uh, digitalization at the plant. And then there's biogas, biogas uh, production and uh, the day we are stopping to incinerate waste in Denmark, and therefore we have to have other sources of heating. Uh, and uh, the Danish wastewater system can uh, can contribute to, uh, to the district heating system in Denmark. Again, the drivers for energy neutrality, Paris Agreement, uh, EU design, uh, for example, there's a, a design requirement for water pumps that said that water pumps should be energy efficient. Uh, on national level, we have a, a goal to be energy neutral in uh, 2030. Uh, we have high prices on green electricity. So when the wastewater companies produce biogas and uh, uh, produce electricity, they get a high price from the from the grid system. Uh, on local level, uh, company economy, it's a good business case. Uh, we can see it have been uh, more expensive in Denmark. Uh, we think it's a good business pay case for the companies. Uh, and then you have energy ambitions for the utilities and municipalities. Yes, that was my short presentation. Thank you so much, Johannes, um, for that comprehensive overview of, of drivers within the Danish um, water sector. Um, in, in light of time, um, I think we'll move ahead to the next section, but please rest assured that we'll summarize all the, the questions and get answers for you and, and disseminate um, after this event. I can see there is one question already, but we'll answer that later. Um, and I would like to um, move to the, to the first panel discussion and introduce Ms. Helle Kisrine Andersen, Head of Denmark Secretariat and Chair of IWA uh, Denmark. So Helle, please take it away with, with your um, panel. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, 
Yes, uh, I am uh, Helix Flynn Andersen and I'm Head of Secretariat at Danva. The Danish Water Association is uh, a member association for everybody with an interest in water. However, only water and wastewater utilities are entitled to uh, vote at our General Assembly and sit on our board. For several years, Danva has been working to strengthen drivers for green transition and resource recovery and our vision is healthy water for sustainable cities and society. And one of our main activities for the past six years has been to facilitate and to strengthen cooperation and uh, partnerships between utilities and the private sector. And in order to do this, Denver created together with the, the two national industries organizations back in 2015, what we call the Danish water vision, where private companies and utilities, universities and authorities, they actually work together with a common goal in 2025 to create 4,000 more workspaces and double the export of Danish water technology. And this cooperation been between, uh, this cooperation between uh, uh, partners has been uh, uh, one of the main drivers for development of new technology and resource recovery because the sector has proactively agreed on ambitious targets and requested ambitious demands both at national and EU level. And um, Johannes Gard, he, he, uh, he explained that uh, just uh, before in his presentation. So in this section, we will uh, be discussing drivers for resource recovery and we will hear about what has brought us to where we are today and also hear the panel speaker's perspective on strategy for reaching resource recovery goals. And I would just like shortly to uh, introduce the panel before I give the word to the, to the first speaker. So the panel consists of Nick Arnsberg, he's project manager and senior water resources advisor at Biofos, which is Denmark's largest wastewater utility uh, uh, plant in, uh, in uh, Greater Copenhagen, treating wastewater from Greater Copenhagen. Then we have Christian Nyrup Nielsen, he's Director of Climate Adaptation and Landscape at Rambøl Water. Then we have Kunal Shah, he is a, a Council Member in Singapore Water Association, Managing Director of Energia. And then we have Dr. Mamta Jain, he is also a council member of Singapore Water uh, Association and he's director of consultancy services at GHI Water and Environment. So uh, we will proceed with the first uh, speaker. Uh, and uh, Nick, please uh, go ahead. You have uh, three minutes and please keep track of time as we, uh, as we only have 30 minutes also for this session. Okay, go ahead, Nick. I think you're, you're muted. Yes, Nick is here. We can't hear you, Nick. Okay. Now we can. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you for letting uh, Biofas uh, participating in this uh, dialogue uh, between uh, Singapore and Denmark. We are happy to contribute to that. I will only give uh, a few words on what we are doing uh, from Biofast side, who we are, and uh, what we are doing to, uh, to come from uh, traditional uh, wastewater treatment to resource recovery and also carbon neutrality, which have been an uh, item uh, for today also. Shortly about who we are, uh, Bifos are the largest uh, wastewater utility in Denmark. If you can see my arrow, we are owned by 15 municipalities 
and we operate actually three uh, wastewater utilities in Denmark, wastewater treatment plants in Denmark. And uh, because we are quite large, uh, we, we serve uh, or treat the wastewater of 1.2 million people living in, in the greater Copenhagen area at our treatment plants. As Dr. Tang uh, also, uh, or Pang also said, we are looking into wastewater as a resource. So we, uh, at the, our three facilities, we produce energies and also we incinerate actually after having produced uh, uh, biogas, we incinerate and deposit uh, our sludge as. But again, we look at it as a, a resource. Waste is a resource and our focus is circular economy. So we get our wastewater in, we treat and let it out to, uh, in this case, the, uh, the sea. And uh, Johannes already said we are quite effective. So we are around uh, far below regulation on the tree wastewater, which of course what we are put in place to do, but we are doing it very effectively. We also produce energy, which we can put to the, to the network as uh, biogas or as uh, uh, electricity. Because we are very close uh, being uh, in the center of Copenhagen, we are close to, to the public grid. So we can, whatever we produce of energy, we can put it on the network. We incinerate also our slots, you can say, which we also can put on the public grid as uh, as heating. At the moment, actually, uh, back in uh, 14, we became uh, energy neutral. Now we produce around 80% more energy than we uh, consume. So we are uh, quite effective in that area. Nick, your time is up now. So uh, could you please uh, okay. uh, uh, close okay. your? But how to uh, keep on track is uh, we have a very uh, modern uh, strategy, which are in compliance with the UN st uh, uh, Development Goals. We seek, of course, to uh, improve our treatment efficiency. And we want to use all our residual products from our core processes to recycle them. And that could be phosphorus, uh, which is a high uh, focus area for us now. And we would like, as uh, Dr. Patton said, to reuse our silicate sand. It could be insulation uh, or, or uh, piles, for example. We are focusing on being carbon absorbing, actually, by 25. We will uh, increase our energy production and uh, we are an active player in uh, innovation and development of new technologies. We actually have a development department at Biofos, which are, which are quite uh, unique. So, was it quick enough, uh, Helen? Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. <laughs> I'm sorry to push you for that much. That's my job. <laughs> okay. Uh, we will... Uh, we will take uh, we we will take questions uh, later. So I think we will quickly uh, proceed with the next uh, panel pitch, and this will be uh, presented by Christian Nyrup Nielsen uh, from Rambøl. Go ahead, Christian. Thank you, Helle Katrine. I'm uh, sharing my screen here. So thanks very much to all uh, for, for letting uh, Ramble have a 
I say here in this discussion, which is of course very relevant to us all, um, as a as a company uh, with uh, which take pride in in sustainable uh, society uh, development, we uh, are uh, based as a as a key player. We like to think it uh, both in Singapore and in the Nordics and in the US, and we therefore see this. Uh, we almost feel obligated to to facilitate knowledge uh, transfer across those uh, areas. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, a, li a little bit about the uh, resource recovery to um, to minimize the use of our natural resources. Uh, uh, Rample is, is taking a lot of uh, actions in this field and and not least in the in the field of innovation regarding this. Right now we are working with the EU. Commission in the Reconnect uh, uh, program to develop new European standards to uh, to regulate and design provide design guidelines for for climate resilience and water resource management by use of large scale nature based solutions. So we find that the the best return of of investment is often with these larger systems uh, uh, on water harvesting and and reuse waste to energy. Etc. And we are working on uh, providing examples and guidelines for for the use of those. Um, so so we are right now uh, working with this and 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 in general on uh, on um, looking for opportunities to provide co benefits through the implementation of integrated infrastructure systems, uh, uh, particular uh, within the water sector. So so. Um, Apart from the regulation as, a, as, of course, a very, very important tool in, in managing the water resource, we also see the, the business case and, and being able to provide a good business case for these solutions as actually key to many of our clients. And we work with them to, to provide uh, uh, a good business case and a solid business case that shows not only the the hard and tangible cost and benefits, but also the to to monetize the co benefits when we introduce uh, these large scale nature based solutions, which we uh, find is is a uh, is a uh, a great uh, part of the the overall solution for water management. And I'll just go through a few examples. Uh, one of them, you know already, uh, the Vision Park. I think this is still one of the the iconic uh, projects uh, on an international scale to both uh, secure uh, uh, climate resilience and to to um, conserve and collect uh, rainwater for 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 use in the in the city. Um, but also the the Vision Park uh, should demonstrate some some good examples of how we reuse materials from the old infrastructure in in providing new. Uh, Kind of amenities for for the local uh, community, uh, which I think we we've learned from and implemented uh, both in in Copenhagen and other places uh, as we speak. So thank you for that <laughs> good example. Uh, then a, a, a little bit more on the hardcore side, uh, something that is uh, is often overlooked is is the optimization of design parameters. For for instance, when we're doing tunneling, if if we are allowed to optimize on the soil characteristics and how we use advanced simulations to, to calculate the loads and of the structures, we are actually uh, able to, to save a, a great deal of natural resources that both benefits in achieving uh, the KPIs in the sustainable development goals, but also of course saves a lot of money. Um, and the last example I would like to uh, show here, if times allow is is a master plan a, a large scale master plan from toronto in canada where we are introducing a completely closed uh, water loop uh, where we are harvesting both water energy and solid waste in 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 a in a loop that you can see here which is uh, closely monetized uh, mo monitored but also um, uh, a, a good combination of the high tech uh, censoring technologies and the nature based solutions. So I, I invite you all to, to uh, enter into a discussion about how this can be implemented on a, on a uh, city wide scale. So thanks, Katrine. I hope this was fast enough. It's fine. 
Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, and I'll refer to the Q and A again, and uh, and rush uh, to the next uh, to the next next pitch presentation. And the next uh, the next pitch will be by Kunal Shah, and uh, Kunal is a managing director of Energy. So please go ahead. Thanks, Elia. I'll just shoot off. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Esther Duwe and the uh, Danish Embassy for inviting me. I do not have a presentation for three minutes of a discussion, but I thought that I would make it a bit more uh, quick in terms of what we as a company do. Uh, so I represent Energia. Uh, we are one of the uh, world's leading organic waste technology provider. Uh, we are in only one business, and that business is resource recovery of municipal, industrial, and agricultural waste um, through solutions. Uh, using proprietary technology. So as a company, we are a technology provider with 250 patents in these sectors. Uh, we as a company design, build, in some cases finance, own and operate facilities uh, globally. Uh, we are working with cities, utilities, industrial corporations, farmers, ag agricultural lands, uh, in, in helping them to reduce the carbon footprint, uh, reduce GHGs, and basically recover resources in the form of clean water, clean fertilizer, and clean energy. Here in uh, the home country, Singapore, uh, we are working very closely with PUB and NEA. Uh, we have set up a demonstration plant, uh, which is co-digesting food waste, uh, which is pre-treated, and sewage sludge to make, uh, uh, to, to make biogas. Now, when it comes to the concept of resource recovery, and this is what I would like to present that, um, I, I think everybody agrees that whenever you look at a city, you have the wastewater people and the waste people. And generally, generally, there is a China wall between the wastewater people and the waste people. Um, we said, okay, when we started the company, we said, how can we make these two brothers or rather sisters talk to each other? And we says the only way to make them talk is to technologies. So as a company, we have proprietary technologies on the waste side of things and proprietary technologies on the wastewater side of things. Uh, we extract organics from mixed waste, not just source segregated waste. So we have kind of changed the definition that how the waste could be managed. So we extract that waste, we clean it, and we bring it either to a merchant anaerobic digestion facility, which we can own and operate, or to an existing sewage treatment plant, where we have technologies to upgrade an existing digester in order to generate, let's say, more biogas. Typically, Wastewater treatment plants across the world are energy consumers. So they are not an energy exporter. Uh, our philosophy is to maximize resource recovery by doing co-digestion, which generates not only enough power to make the wastewater plant energy neutral, but to also export that power. So uh, one concept is co-digestion. The second is biogas to electricity is one form of energy. Uh, we are seeing a lot more focus on renewable natural gas, which is used for decarbonizing natural gas network and green hydrogen. So as a company, we do the entire suite of solution from waste coming into the facility or sludge coming into the facility. And at the end, either you get green energy or green gas. And in the future, maybe green hydrogen. The third angle is what we all uh, saw and discussed was the angle of fertilizer. So biosolids being used for better purpose. Uh, we have solutions which uh, can also take care of what we call the emerging contaminants called the PFAS, which is a big problem, not only in the in, in, in some parts of the world, but many parts of the world, and there are regulations coming there. So we have solutions on sludge management, anaerobic digestion, the biogas uh, side of the things, sludge side of the things, where we take the digestate, we convert that into either biochar or a fertilizer. And last but not the least is nutrients, which we heard many people talking that nutrient recovery is also very important. So in a nutshell, as a company, sorry, Hela, if, if I'm late, but yeah, in a nutshell, I would say we as a company focus on maximizing resource recovery and believe in doing more with less. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a very quick and precise pitch. Uh, we will uh, go ahead with our last, last pitch presenter. And, uh, and this is uh, Mamta Jain, Dr. Mamta Jain, uh, Director of Consultancy Services at DHI Water and Environment. Please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Vela. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, uh, Singapore Water Association and Danish uh, uh, at, um, Embassy for giving us this opportunity to be on this stage. And uh, uh, DHI is, as everyone knows in Singapore, most of companies know we are a water environment company. So we take more of like a soft approach rather than a hardcore innovation and technologies. So as water as a resource, it has an embedded energy and therefore comes the carbon. And then the challenge is actually addressing to make this uh, exchange efficient between the water and the energy part. And that's the quest we are on. So for us to say, it is important to save water as a resource. And at the same time, understand the balance and also understand how we can implement the innovation and technology so that we are uh, keeping up at the pace of uh, what we are going for. So, and along with the order comes the natural step, which is environmental angle. So, and that's where the sustainability part comes in. So, DHI is a water and environment company. We make sure that our projects are about environmental assessments and sustainability component is added to it as well. So, what we do is we actually focus on science-based and evidence-based approach, and we use the data and the modeling tools that we have developed to address these solutions. In the sustainability in the climate uh, space, DHI has uh, three pillars that we write on. One is the ESG risk assessment, where we look into the impact, in the impact of investing, nature-based solution, and we also work with the task force for climate-related disclosures. Next one is a sustainability, where we focus on sustainability reporting, strategy, sustainable construction, supply chain, and also there is a research angle to it. Last one is a carbon advisory where we look into the carbon footprinting, carbon credits, blue carbon, and Center for Climate uh, Change uh, ex uh, Excellence. So in terms of the water environment space, DHI has been, uh, so, uh, been involved with the projects in Singapore, both with PUB and many other agencies. So I would just like to quickly highlight some of the work that we have done, and I'm sure I think most of the companies on the uh, uh, and the audience are aware of it. So uh, desalination plants, we have been uh, heavily involved with almost all the desalination plants that PUB has undertaken in the Singapore space. We have been involved with the uh, used water reclamation facilities. We have been also involved in the reverse uh, osmosis uh, uh, process plants in Singapore to ensure that there are uh, little impact to the environment from the NEA perspective. And at the same time, the water can be recycled and be used so this actually allows us to keep the potable water for the population and allows us to also save or reuse the waste water and then uh, here, thereby reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, one thing I would also like to mention is we have been uh, heavily involved with uh, many climate change and sustainability projects uh, in the government. And we are also being involved with the nature-based solutions where we are working in how do we provide soft approaches uh, from the climate perspective. Uh, the uh, Dr. Chen uh, mentioned about the landfill issues that we have in Singapore. We know we only have one space which is filling up very quickly. DHI is also working with the uh, NEA and other agencies to ensure how the, the uh, incinerated water fill material can be reused for various activities in Singapore. So these are some of the things that we have been uh, working for. And uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am Chen. And uh... Then we will have a, a short round of, uh, of uh, some uh, uh, questions and then we will, uh, we will uh, have Q&A's. I see no uh, Q&A's uh, at this stage, so, so I, can, uh, I can start with, uh, with uh, a few questions for the panel. So uh, Christian and Nick, uh, please uh, turn your camera on also. You can, uh, you can put your camera on, then we have a, a real panel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, Kunal, uh, when I was uh, preparing for this session, I was uh, searching your web page and, and you say that where some see waste, we see resources. And I believe this is uh, pretty much the mindset that we really need to cement through the, through the utility sectors, also to bridge sectors, as, as you were saying. But, but, but what would you say would be the, the key factors which play a role uh, as catalysts in, in government agencies, cities and utilities to move towards resource recovery? 
Thanks. Uh, it's a good question, actually. I mean, as a technology company, people will always say, OK, technology can bring the change with what people want in the world. But I'm going to I'm going to differ that a bit. And what I believe is that the, there are a few key factors. Uh, either it has to be the economics, which has to enable uh, resource recovery. Either it has to be regulations. And we saw interesting regulations being drafted by the Danish government and the EU, which ultimately will lead to resource recovery. And last but not the least is, you know, we call it necessity is the mother of invention. Um, in some cases, there are social political uh, reasons. Day zero, we all remember what happened in Cape Town and in a few other uh, other cities. So I think these three factors are important. I just take one short example. In some cases where, uh, for example, economics, we have seen that the reuse water uh, is cheaper than, let's say, seawater desalination in places where uh, if they had to set up a new desalination plant versus reusing their wastewater. So that's one angle. Regulation. Uh, we have ourselves seen that uh, in the United States, for example, there is a massive regulation for renewable natural gas. So if there is a wastewater plant and you make biogas, you inject the biogas into renewable natural gas into the pipeline, you get crazy amount of uh, incentives. So I think the last one would be the carrot and stick mechanism. You cannot just have a regulation, which is a, a stick, but you also need to have an incentive, which is a carrot. And I think everywhere where we have seen in the Western part of the world and in some developed nations here, there has always been that nice synergy between a carrot and stick mechanism. We have seen that in the solar sector and in the wind sector. Look what has happened to the sector today. So I think resource recovery can definitely and is going to be mainstream. No more. It's going to be like an option. And it has to be that uh, that concept of economics, regulation, and socio-political uh, situation, which would play a, a bigger role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kunal, for this, uh, for this answer. I think uh, uh, mentioning the carrot and stick, this is pretty much what, what has been presented for, for Denmark also. So, so Nick, uh, what, 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 what would you, uh, what would you say uh, representing uh, Biofirst, one of the very ambitious and also very proactive wastewater treatment plants uh, or resource facilities in Denmark. What, yeah. what, what has been the main driver for you as a, 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 as, a, as a utility in order to reach the position where you are today? Um, could you give a reflection? <laughs> yeah, uh, Helle, being among uh, or the biggest in Denmark, we recognize our social responsibility. So that's why we said our strategy and our uh, key performance indicators quite high, meaning we, we go below emission standards and so on. Uh, and we we monitor them. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> recognized we are quite ambitious in that area. But also we are constrained a little as uh, said regulation. We cannot charge our customers. So if you want us to treat even better than we do or produce more energy, it's more uh, costs. Uh, so we, we are in uh, the balance uh, on these things, but still, uh, uh, better than uh, required. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Nick. So, 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 so this was also be a, a combination actually, and 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 stick uh, of stick and carrot, but but a lot of uh, uh, carrot actually also you say with the with the uh, social uh, corporate social responsibility. So, exactly. so, Mam Ma Jane. Uh, uh, what, what, what would you say, representing a consultancy, uh, how, how important do you see economic or regu regulatory drivers for, for creating demands? Does it matter uh, or is the sustainable, uh, sustainability agenda, is that, is that sufficient to, to, to drive the demand of new technology and new solutions? I'm sure that the Danish population would like to have a better environment, uh, even better than we can uh, can do. We can now bath in uh, the, uh, the harbor of Copenhagen. 
And, thank, uh, thank, you, thank you, Nick. I was uh, I was trying to to get the Mamta into the into the discussion. So so oh, thank okay. you very much. So so I was asking Mamta to 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 jump in and 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 give us her perspective on that. Uh, thanks, Hala. Uh, sorry, Nick. Uh, I think Hala has to interrupt you. And I think I would say the question started very well with uh, Bernard's response on a combination of a carrot and stick. And I mean, from the Southeast Asian perspective and from the consultancy point of view, how I see actually economic and regulatory drivers are really important because that's what defines and that's what actually drives and that ensures that these goals are met because. I mean, how uh, I see that, I mean, 15 years ago, the environmental impact assessment became a requirement in Singapore and, uh, and from then onwards, every project required environmental impact assessment. So going forward, I mean, I see uh, there is a strong need from the agencies to have this economic and regulatory driving drivers to, uh, to, make, to meet these sustainability needs. But at the same time, I would still say there is a carrot and stick uh, combination here as well, because one is you enforce it, but at the same time, if you reward the companies that they are doing it, it will actually help to achieve the goals much faster than uh, it would otherwise. So I also see it as, an, as a combination. I mean, sustainability as an agenda with the, the UN SDGs and uh, all the buzz that we are having in the last couple of years, it is self-propelling, but at the same time, there is uh, a need for a stronger trust and that stronger curse trust backed up by the funding. I mean, that is where will be another challenge that would come in, especially, I mean, in Singapore landscape, uh, we do not have that much of a problem with respect to funding. But when we talk about other developing countries in the Southeast Asia and implementation of uh, uh, sustainability and, and, and these economic drivers would be very, very difficult without uh, without a top-down approach and also backed up with uh, some uh, mechanism of uh, funding from EUs, the World Banks, the ADBs. So I, I see again it's a com combination of the approach rather than yeah. just one way. Thank, thank you, Mamsa, for, 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 for these uh, uh, thoughts and, and your answer on this. Uh, so, so Christian, you are, uh, your job as a, as a global director on resilience and water resources management, that is to create livable and sustainable cities and landscapes. So, so what would you say are the lowest hanging avenues cities could explore uh, leading to better uh, resource recovery? Simple question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I would say that, that, that if you're looking for low hanging avenues, I, I don't know if you would characterize this as, as a low hanging avenue, but, but uh, uh, taking this integrated approach across the systems, the infrastructure systems, as also was referred to before, looking at water, waste, mobility, um, uh, climate resilience in one, really. Uh, Really, for us, is the key to be be able to to provide uh, to to provide the large scale projects that that really can fly and and show a really really good business case, a surprisingly good business case, I would say. So, if you allow yourself as a city or utility company to to look across the systems and and also across the budgets that you have allocated, then uh, you would often find uh, that that. Um, there are some low hanging fruits there. Uh, and, and I would add to that, that this also would often uh, help, you know, creating the buy-in from stakeholders uh, across uh, these organizations and also in the public. So I think this is, this should be the, the first step. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not simple, but it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for, for, for this answer. Uh, I don't see any. Uh, I don't see any Q and A's uh, uh, for the panel speakers. But um, but but again, we uh, we also uh, we also uh, uh, a little pressed by by time. So um, so I think uh, I think I will uh, I will uh, end this uh, end this session and 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 very shortly conclude that. Uh, that that uh, 
again see, seeing this uh, that that I was uh, referring to, to to this vision from from Energia that they have where some sea water uh, waste we see resources it's it's very about much about new mindset it's about uh, it's about working uh, across sectors uh, allow to work across systems and use as you said Christian and uh, and 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 having an integrated uh, approach, and then we need a combination of of, of drivers of carrot carrots and and sticks also, which which we have seen. So, so and and then cooperation. I think could could sum it all up. Co cooperation between uh, 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 private and 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 public partners. That that would also be be very. Uh, um, um, well, that's mandatory for, for reaching the solutions that we need to, to reach. So, so thank you very much uh, to the to the panel uh, speakers, and uh, I will give the, the word back to, uh, to to Mark for introducing the uh, the next uh, the next section. So, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Helen and the panelists. Um, looking at the time, I think it's pretty clear that we'll run maybe uh, fifteen minutes over time. Um, I hope that's okay with everyone. Uh, I think it's very clear to see that both Singapore and Denmark have come very far in the in the resource recovery journeys. Uh, one thing to consider maybe for for future um, discussion is how how can we then transfer those lessons learned to to other countries in order to accelerate uh, their development. Uh, maybe something for the twenty fifth. Uh, that being said, um, I would now like to introduce uh, Mr. Alan uh, Teo. A managing Director of Quirkus Group in Singapore. And Alan will be hosting a, a panel on what are the innovations um, that that Denmark and Singapore see within water resource recovery. So, Alan, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Good morning and good afternoon, friends and colleagues. So, my name is Alan Thiel from Quirkus Group, a Danish consultancy firm focusing on multi-stakeholder engagement, market entry and cluster development within the broad space of sustainability. So I'm based here in Singapore, and I'll be the moderator for this session on innovation and solutions of tomorrow. Before I introduce the panelists, uh, let me share with you something interesting that happened today. I received an unusual postcard. So, beautiful postcard with clear blue waters and nice blue skies. And but the date of the postcard is 11 May 2050. And here's the message. Dear Alan, greetings from the year 2050. 2050 is a fantastic time to be alive. The skies are clear, air sweet, water refreshing, and the future is bright. The world finally got together and worked hard over the past 30 years to drive innovation and collaborations in creating truly circular economies where resources are fully recovered from waste streams. But this was only made possible through the leadership and courage shown by industries governments, academia, and key partners around the world, including all of you at the Denmark-Singapore Water Dialogue on Resource Recovery on 11th May 2021. Singapore and Denmark have been key leaders in global collaborations and innovation and showed the world how engines of economies can be replaced with sustainable solutions. So thank you all for your courage and leadership and for taking action and driving innovation. Your friends from the future. So, friends and colleagues, so thanks to your leadership, courage, collaboration, innovation, and bold action, so a sustainable and bright future can be a reality. And with that, let's dive right into this session. So joining us in this session are three key panelists from industry to share with us the innovations they are driving and the game-changing solutions on the horizon. So we have on the panel, Mr. Goa Enghok, Director of SG Enviro Private Limited. Mr. Christian Viet, Chief Commercial Officer of AquaGreen APS. And Mr. Ryan Kwa, Operation Manager of Novex Private Limited. Let me invite each of the panelists to give a four minute key highlight of the key innovations they are working on. And I'll briefly just introduce uh, each of them. So let's with, start with uh, Mr. Goa Enghok. Uh, Gua has been involved in the sustainable development space for quite many years, starting with turning plastics to fuel back in 2010 and being a pioneer in the construction, demolition, recycling, and road recycling space, and moving towards the waste water treatment space. So Gua is based in Singapore. Uh, Gua, your four minutes starts now. 
Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay, I'll just give a very high level introduction of my company and some of the innovations. Uh, if you need further details or clarifications, right? Uh, I've left my contact on the last page of this presentation, so you can keep a look out for that. Um, actually, Enviro, we're actually an EPC company, and we are using our own proprietary non-thermal plasma technology for the production of uh, active radical species to oxidize pollutants in the industrial wastewater. Uh, and, and this is just basically, um, in a nutshell, a few ways that we can generate uh, this species and how we inject it. Uh, the first being a, a remote system, where we generate the active species and use nanobubble technology to um, inject it into the industrial wastewater um, to treat the pollutants. Uh, the second one is through the creation of uh, UV using our um, nanoplasma technology. And the last one, uh, which is the most powerful one, is actually using a direct plasma system. Um, due to the time constraint, I, I won't go into each of these uh, in detail, but um, um, this is what our technology looks like uh, briefly. Okay. We have had um, quite a number of successes applying this technology uh, across several industries, especially in oil and gas, um, in mining, and in the industries such as uh, palm oil, uh, gold mining for cyanide detoxification, um, and also in detergent plant, sugar mills. Um, we have had a lot of success uh, in river decontamination and the odorization as well, especially in rivers, polluted rivers. Um, we're now trying out our system in aqua farming. And we've also had quite a fair bit of success in wastewater recycling, especially for apartments and, and offshore platforms. Okay. Now, while we're on this topic of um, um, resource recovery, right, I thought I'd like to borrow um, this pyramid from the solid waste industry that I was involved in before. Um, this is actually called the waste hierarchy. And in solid waste industry, right, for the waste hierarchy, it shows you what are some of the desirable and, and, and not so desirable actions. Uh, most favored action is actually at the top of the pyramid, and the least favored option is actually at the bottom of the pyramid. All right. And, and that starts off with uh, like waste prevention, waste minimization, reuse, recycling, a lot of which that uh, Dr. Pang actually introduced um, in, in this morning in the, in the PUB's strategy. And, and towards the bottom part is the disposal, which is the landfilling, uh, and then um, energy recovery, which is incineration. Uh, in solid ways, uh, these last two options are always seen as the last resort. All right, so I just wanna draw a comparison between resource recovery, which is quite akin to like recycling, right? In, in this case, for wastewater. Um, there, are, there are also other, um, uh, apart from resource recovery, there are also other more desirable options that, that we should also look at uh, as well, all right? Uh, why I say that? Because uh, I just want to do a bit of a quick introduction of one of our landmark projects that we're actually involved in. Um, due to confidentiality reasons, I can only call this an oil storage facility. Uh, this is actually one of our landmark projects in Jurong Island. Uh, it's actually an underground oil storage facility. Uh, there's quite a fair bit of technical innovation and challenges for this project. Firstly, this cavern is unmined, and the cavern roofs are actually under the ground, below the groundwater table. And there's actually a water curtain gallery around the cavern uh, to create water pressure to keep the oil within the cavern. All right. So what have we done through this project uh, are as follows. Uh, some of the innovations that we actually did for this project was firstly, um, through the use of our AOP technology, right, we were able to reduce the amount of sludge that was generated uh, through the water treatment in this process. Okay, and because the sludge itself was reduced, the chemical use for the precipitation was um, also correspondingly reduced as well. So this was what I meant by apart from resource recovery, there's also other more favored options that we should always look at as well: um, uh, waste minimization, sludge reduction, and chemical reduction. Um, and then the treated water is also recovered and re-injected into the water curtain gallery uh, to create the pore pressure around the um, uh, cavens, right? And that's recycling. So going forward, there's also a few other um, optimizations that we're actually working with the clients 
um, for this particular project, which is uh, resource recovery uh, to investigate the recovery of minerals from sludge um, uh, separation or sludge stream uh, because there are actually two different uh, wastewater stream coming from this particular project. One was actually from the groundwater and the other one's actually from the wastewater itself. Right, so I, we, we saw that there's actually some potential for resource recovery through the sludge uh, in this particular project. And, well, and also, four minutes is pretty much here now. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's my last point. Uh, also, working at uh, looking at carbon uh, CO2 capture. All right, so as promised, this is actually my last slide, and my contact is actually uh, on this slide itself. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Gua. Appreciate it. So, let's move on now to uh, Mr. Christian V. Christian has been working uh, with sustainable solutions throughout his career and been in the enzyme space for quite many years now. He was involved in production R&D before moving to commercial roles, where he also focuses on partnerships and innovation. Christian is based in Roskilde in Denmark. Christian, your four minutes starts now. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. So, uh, this is about resource recovery from sludge. And we heard from Dr. Pang in the first uh, session this morning that uh, Singapore is aiming at reducing the sludge with 30%. And uh, AquaGreen is a new company working with new innovation. We have made uh, an integrated steam dryer and pyrolysis plant, which uh, we believe is a game changer in uh, sludge management. It's a system that is uh, continuous and, and fully automated and uh, being commercialized now in 2021. Uh, we have two orders for Danish wastewater plants in 21, and we have uh, a lot of interest for this. Uh, 10 more uh, customers following this implementation and uh, being pretty much ready to order. Uh, we are open and very interested in exploring uh, Singapore and Asia opportunities. And also aware that uh, the size of this equipment uh, is maybe still too small for uh, for Singapore. Let me just see how can I. There we go. So the current uh, plants we're selling uh, covers 50,000 PE, and and as you can see, the footprint is small. It's 10 by 15 meters. Um, we de we dry the dewatered sludge in a, uh, a superheated steam dryer and then the, the sludge, the dried sludge is pyrolyzed and uh, we do that by simply by using the energy uh, from the sludge itself so we can actually dry the sludge without adding uh, additional energy using the calorific values of the sludge that we get from burning uh, the gases we get out of the pyrolysis. Out of this, we get a biochar, which has plant available phosphorus. So we can also now recycle, uh, you would say a critical uh, element here. And this can also be further processed into uh, activated carbon, which can be used as a filter material. Uh, oh, um, so the benefits for municipal wastewater, uh, let me just see. Benefits for municipal wastewater treatment plant are huge. Uh, we reduce uh, emissions uh, for, for a 50,000 PE plant. Uh, we reduce uh, 1,800 tons of CO2 emissions a year because we eliminate the uh, emissions from the uh, wet sludge, which is being stored. In Denmark, at least, it's being stored up to nine months a year and then uh, applied on uh, farmland. In Singapore, if it's put into a landfill, it will also have emissions maybe for even longer. We can, uh, from the steam dryer, we can actually uh, recover the energy by condensating the steam after the drying. So we also create, in this case, uh, 1600 tons of CO2 equivalent of renewable energy. And we can store 500 tons of CO2 equivalents by storing the biochar uh, through application on soil land. We degrade all the organic pollutants and we actually end up with 10 times less uh, amount of, of dry matter. So uh, much less, uh, if you want to go for landfill in Singapore, you'll have 10 times less uh, solid matter going into landfill. The return on investment is very favorable. 
around three to six years, depending on your cost for sludge handling and transportation. So we see a lot of interest for these, uh, new, uh, this new technology. You can see my uh, contact information here, uh, chwi at aquagreen.dk. Um, hope to hear from uh, many of you if you're interested in hearing more about the innovation that we have made. Thanks a lot for allowing us to uh, talk at the seminar and uh, in, look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Christian. And finally, we now have uh, Mr. Ryan Kwok. Ryan has been involved in the waste to energy space and also in water reclamation prior to joining Novak seven years ago. Ryan's a mechanical engineer by training and uh, he's based in Singapore. And Ryan has shared with me that he's an avid cyclist, so I'm sure he'll fit very well in Copenhagen. So Ryan, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh... Once again, thank you, Javier, for the invitation. Uh, honored to be here. Uh, just sharing on the uh, EOP system. Ryan, could you put your presentation in, sorry, in presentation mode? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. Okay. I'm from Novax Private Limited. We're actually formed by a group of uh, engineers uh, from pharmaceutical and the uh, refinery back in 2001. Uh, we are specialized in petrochem. Science. We are also a uh, local representative of uh, large scale engineering, commonly known as uh, engineering, and we provide waste to energy incineration and also a uh, dice bed incinerator, incinerate bio sludge, and also to cover the phosphorus in the sludge. So, the main topic um, why is on the why is the S3 advanced oxidation process? Well, unlike conventional mechanical treatment and uh, biological treatment, the AOP system is actually a reaction system. It actually uses oxidation to break down the dissolved organic contaminants. As such, it is largely dependent on the composition and the concentration of the water. And uh, the high oxidation property of the hydroxyl radical is good at, uh, is proven to be very good in breaking down the long hydrocarbon chain into water, CO2, Organic and non-organic ions. As such, uh, minimum or no sludge is produced. However, the challenge currently has been to generate this uh, sedizing, sedizing sugar at a low cost, where conventional methods such as ozone, UV, or even hydrogen peroxide requires high operating costs, high carbon, uh, high footprint. So. What we have in our, uh, what we offer uh, is actually a two stage uh, treatment system. Uh, the first is this uh, static hydro reactor, SHR, where it's actually a catalytic based media uh, where it oxidizes, pollutants, formulate, and populate. It has been proven uh, effective in the treatment of dissolved phosphate oil in grease, surfactants, cyanide, and even benzene and xylene. In a nutshell, uh, it operates in the MS spray condition. Each single stage uses only 10 minutes of uh, reaction time. And uh, the only inputs are compressed air with oxygen, the influence. I'll elaborate the rest later. The next stage is our dynamic hydro reactor, DHR. Again, it operates at a atmospheric condition. And the reaction time is only 20 minutes. Uh, this time around, it has an additional usage of a 48 volt DC electrical array to generate, uh, along with the oxygen, to generate the production of hydrogen radical. So, as mentioned, there's no additional chemical required at all. Uh, it promises long operational life due to the no moving parts, yes, uh, there's minimum operation. In fact, the, uh, the car, one of our first installations in Singapore has been operating for six years and still counting. Uh, the media has not been it's not been consumed, and uh, we have yet changed. However, uh, depending on the water condition, it needs to be cleaned or replaced. So the biggest project we have uh, is in Saudi Arabia. It is treating about eighteen thousand meter cube per day. 
So this system is so versatile that you can use it as a free treatment to suit your biological treatment or as a polishing agent prior to discharge. So as such, I'll end my slide and I'll use my contact if you are, want to put me for more details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. And thanks again, Christian and Gua. So there were some um, very interesting technologies and innovation you have, but I think ladies and gentlemen, let's push them uh, a little bit for more. Um, so I think you presented some interesting areas and innovation uh, mm -hmm. on what you're doing today. Um, but I mean, this session is really about also what uh, the solutions for tomorrow. So I think you're keeping your cards a bit close to your vest uh, today. So maybe, um, Gua, could you share with us, I think some of the key challenges hindering your organization in driving innovation and leading transformation in the resource recovery space. I think you touched a little bit on that, on what's coming up in the future, but how, how are you, what are you doing to address some of these key challenges to really take you towards that next phase? Um, uh, thanks, Alan. I think that's a, that's a very um, valid question and very relevant to us now. Um, well, you know, in terms of resource recovery, because um, you know, whenever we talk about waste, right, one of the key things is that who, who owns the waste? It's a very um, uh, ironical question, but ownership of the waste is actually a very important uh, topic. So whoever owns the waste, right, then decide what to do with the waste, all right? Right, so if you are working strictly on the wastewater treatment project, and then you want to go a step further to say that, I, I think we can recover some resource from the sludge and things like that. Sometimes the client is not that not that interested, and then they are not so open to some of these new concepts and ideas. Um, many a times, I think you're only seeing those clients. They are very advanced in terms of their thinking that they actually will start to look at this kind of resource recovery technology. Whereas most of them just want to get rid and of of the wastewater. They they see it as a byproduct, right? So so I guess my set my set uh, part of things is actually one of the biggest challenges that we face. Right, great. Thanks for that. I think that's a really important point. And of course, just referencing uh, Kunal earlier, talking about what are the key drivers towards that or what's really the key um, push towards that. Is it technology, uh, economics or uh, regulation? I think from my perspective, as agreeing with you, it's really about changing the mindset. Is it taking the leadership uh, towards this change? Um, Christian, I think you look like you want to respond to this uh, question on the challenges as well and you know what are the key challenges and what you are doing to address some of this. Uh, I think anytime you come in with a new technology or new innovation, uh, it's not just making it work technically but also commercially. In our case, we end up producing biochar with 10 times less volume than over or the waste than the sludge itself. So we need to find and set up a new value chain for using the biochar, applying the biochar on soil. The people today that are transporting and, and applying the, bio, the, the sludge on soil, they will lose money because we are taking away 90% of the handling they do. So, so we end up having uh, different interests the, the people that are making money on handling the sludge or transporting it are not interested in the new technology that is uh, making it much more sustainable and, and uh, better better value. We take out a lot of pollutants and so on. That's uh, and also the legislation has to be updated to to manage um, the new type of of uh, resource. Uh, so there's a lot of barriers coming into a new field, and we have to work both with uh, public authorities and with setting up private uh, players in a new way together with our customers who will actually own the biochar, the, the wastewater treatment. Got that. I think thanks, thanks for that, Christian. And I think that's a very valid point. Uh, coming to you, Ryan. Um, I think you work very much in the, uh, the operations and the processes side of things, uh, of course, with, Technolo um, technology innovation, uh, we also need uh, other innovation, including business model innovation, policy innovation, and process innovation. So can, can you share with us a bit more on where you see 
uh, this going from your point of view in terms of uh, the next phase of innovation here? Well, um, I think innovation for me is just a, a doing things differently. Um, as mentioned before, it is always a function of uh, acceptance, economics, ground level, technologies. So um, things, it will always progress. People always like to do things easier. That's always how, how uh, innovation changes come about. Uh, so even with the current COVID situation, uh, in Singapore especially, the lack of manpower, uh, it will drive things uh, differently in terms of uh, more, less labor intensive. And of course, uh, currently we're talking about uh, energy consumption in the energy neutral and carbon neutral. So these are all uh, many aspects that innovations can uh, and support. Great, thank you for that, Brian. And um, I think this session is also very much about um, collaboration, about partnership, and of course, we are talking about Denmark, Singapore coming together, uh, driving this forward. And uh, we saw, I think, from the, uh, the postcard that it was possible that uh, Denmark and Singapore are leading the way. But I think from a cultural perspective, I think Singapore, um, where Singaporeans have been you know, drilled from young to focus very much on achievement, academic achievement, score better than the peers, competing to get into better schools. Whereas from the Danish perspective, from the young age, is very much on collaboration, learning to play, engaging one another. Um, Christian, just um, share, uh, maybe you could share with, with us, with these different mindsets, how do you see us um, collaborating? I think that it's, it's just essential for uh, companies across countries to, to collaborate. We don't know exactly where to start in Singapore and, and likewise if you have the Singaporean technology and you want to move into Denmark you will find a way to collaborate and I think you would say yes we learn different things in schools different school systems but in the end we are we're not that different and, and uh, especially when you're talking something that's uh, science-based and technology-based and, yeah. and medical it's it's not such a big difference uh, we just need to understand the, the objective and, and the goals, and, and then we will find a way together. Great, thanks. Thanks, Christian. I think maybe just one last comment. I think we're probably running out of time. Gua, you want to respond to that? Yeah, actually, I, I, I wanted to jump in on this question as well. Okay. In that, um, aside from seeing the differences, I, I thought I'd like to highlight the similarity between Denmark and Singapore. I think we almost have about the same population. We have yeah. a very small population. And because we both have a very small population, we have to try and make the best use of resources. So in the end, it, it makes um, both Danish and, and Singaporeans very pragmatic people. And I think especially when it comes to technology invention, if you are pragmatic, I think that's going to be a very good technology. So I see a lot of very much similarity between uh, uh, um, Denmark and Singapore as well. So I definitely feel that in terms of collaboration, that you'll, you'll be a very harmonious kind of a collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. I think that's uh, certainly um, very, very um, apt in terms of the approach, looking at focusing on the similarities and where we could uh, complement one another at the same time. And um, I am mindful that um, time is running out. Um, Mark, so maybe, yeah, um, with that, I think there we have it. And once again, I think with, um, with key leadership from all of you, courage and action, I think we can create lasting positive impact. So thank you all panelists for your insights and also thank you everyone. Thanks, thanks Alan. And, and thanks to everyone for, for listening in um, and staying with us uh, a bit longer. Uh, it's, it's very clear that there's a, there's a huge amount of technical know-how in, in Denmark and Singapore uh, combined. And we very much look forward to, to putting some of all the, of, of this know-how into action uh, during our event on the 25th of June. Uh, we also very much look forward to actually meeting uh, everyone physically at Singapore Border Week uh, 2022. So with those words, I would like to pass the, the word to, to Vivian for her closing remarks from Singapore Water Association. Vivian, please. Yes, thank you, Mark. So thank you, speakers, and thank you all for joining us today. 
we appreciate much if you can complete this one minute survey before you leave the session. If you, can, if you cannot see the poll survey, please click on the polling icon. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yes. For the upcoming events, we have more series of webinars to share with our members and partners. Please follow our update in our website. For further queries, please contact the SWA Executive Office or Mr. Andreas from the Danish Export Association. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Stay well. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye -bye.